Hello class, my name is, is Mr. George Gitonga. I'm from the Institute of Security Studies, Justice and Ethics under the School of Social Sciences. Today I'll be taking you through BJS 4230, Forensic Investigation. So today our lesson will be on Crime Scene Management. So without any further ado, we first of all start by defining what a crime scene is. So you have two definitions, the first one being a place where crime occurred and also a place where evidence can be obtained or collected. So under these we either have what is known as a primary or secondary crime scene or also depending on the type of uh, crime we are, building, we are dealing with could either be a suicide scene or a murder scene. So some examples of crime scenes we have could be inside a building. Maybe you can find a body has been dumped inside a building or also in an open space like a field or even inside a vehicle. Even in some cases we have where the human body is a crime scene. So for this one, where the human body is a crime scene, it fits this second criteria, a place where evidence could be collected. So for example, on a body that somebody has been killed, we'll find some hair or some soil or some fibers. So here, we'll get evidence. Therefore, the body can also serve as a crime scene. So you can look at the purpose of a crime scene investigation. So when you want to conduct a crime scene, crime scene investigation, you're trying to establish what happened. So by that is when you do crime scene reconstruction, and also you want to establish who is responsible for the crime that has been committed. So that's why you say that when you're trying to determine physical evidence, it will help you in solving and prosecuting a crime. So you also have to establish corpus delicti. So this corpus delicti is the facts that constitute a crime. So for example, if we have a body, the dead, I mean we have a murder, the dead body is the corpus delicti. So to show that a murder was committed, we must have a dead body. So this talks about the evidentiary clues that can tell us the modus operandi or the method of operation, the time where the crime was committed, the weapons that were used, and also who is responsible for committing the crime. Then also, it can give us leads. So leads is like a clue that can help in breaking a case or moving it forward. Then also, to establish whether the crime scene you're dealing with is real or fake. So sometimes, someone may fake a crime scene to try to deceive the investigators, then also to establish the sequence of events. So the sequence is to tell us how, how did the crime unfold. So now we look at primary and secondary crime scene. So the primary crime scene is where the crime originally occurred. So for example, if somebody was killed outside in a field, where the crime occurred is where you have the primary crime scene. Then you have the secondary crime scene. So the secondary crime scene is any subsequent crime scene. So for example, if you kill that person in the field, then you move the body to somewhere in a forest. So the forest is the secondary crime scene. So sometimes this secondary crime scene could be the source of evidence. So for example, you can find discarded clothing or maybe you dump the weapon somewhere else, or even blood trails where you dumped the body. There could be some blood trails. So primary is the original crime scene. Secondary is any subsequent crime scene. Then you also have the first responder. So the first responder is the first police officer who will arrive at the crime scene. So he has a number of duties. So the first and foremost, if there are still victims in that crime scene, he must assist the victims. So it's his responsibility to give them first aid. Then also, he must, if the suspect is still around, he needs to 
arrest the suspect or if he cannot find the suspect immediately, try to search for and apprehend the suspect. Then the third part, detain the witnesses. Why is this point important? Because these witnesses will discuss and along the way, someone's account will change. So therefore you have distorted the original testimony of the eyewitness. Then also to protect the crime scene. So this is done through barrier tape to ensure that only authorized people are able to access this crime scene. Then also, do not use any facilities at the crime scene. So for example, if there's a toilet within the crime scene, he must not use this toilet. Why is this so? Because he will contaminate. So this contamination may first of all uh, mess up the investigation. Then also, no eating, drinking, or smoking within the scene. Why is this important? For example, if you drink and you throw your bottle or your can, you see you leave your own saliva which has DNA evidence. And as a result, you have contaminated the crime scene. Or even when you smoke a cigarette, then you dump the cigarette, but you leave your DNA also on that cigarette and hence compromise this investigation because you have contaminated your crime scene. Then also, he must observe what is going on in the crime scene. So he must report any changes that occur as is inside the crime scene. So then after that, he must report them to the uh, scene investigator. Then also he must document whatever they have done. So they can either record or put them in note form. And also he must avoid making any mistakes. Because any mistakes that he shall do, they will compromise or jeopardize the whole investigation. Then we talk about securing the crime scene. So the purpose of this is to make sure that the integrity of the crime scene has been maintained or preserved. So to make sure that no evidence has been either added, removed, or damaged. So to make sure that evidence is as it was originally was. Then also, as you secure the crime scene, it will also restrict access. So unless you're part of the investigative team, this securing the crime scene using the barrier tape will make sure that no one, no one else is able to enter the crime scene. So the people who are supposed to be restricted access, we have non-essential personnel, the witnesses, the relatives of the victim, neighbors, and even the news media. So they're supposed to be outside the crime scene. The, so this one, you'll use the crime scene tape to guard the crime scene. So you have a, an illustration of how you secure a crime scene. So you see we have this barrier tape here, this one in yellow. So it ensures that nobody can enter this crime scene unless they are authorized. Then you also have the multi-level security. So here in level three, this is the crime scene. So only the investigative team can be able to access here. Then level two, you have the, maybe the people, the security, what to make sure that nobody comes into the crime scene. Then here, outside here is where you have everyone else, the public, the media center, so the people in this blue zone, they are not allowed to come into the crime scene. And you have the command center. So the command center will coordinate everything here. They'll be coordinating everything. So you have what is known as the scene of crime officer. So his work is to provide scientific support to the investigation. So for example, to do fingerprint examinations and also other forensic examinations. So in case the police need any scientific support, it is them to come into play. So they have a very important role. So either their success or failure may jeopardize the investigation. So first of all, they need to be able to recognize and collect the relevant evidence. So if you're not able to do either of these roles, 
you have failed in the first place. Then also, once they collect this evidence, they need to be able to avoid it getting contaminated. And also, provide the correct samples for comparison. Because whatever they collect here needs to go to the forensic lab to be compared to maybe what they collect further down in the investigation. So now, this scene of crime officer must be able to recognize the correct clues, to preserve them, to pack them, and to make sure the integrity of the evidence is maintained. So you have what is known as practical investigative problems. So it involves actually being able to collect the evidence properly, to preserve it, so that it can be sent to the lab for evaluation. So this we look at in further detail. Then also we talk about being able to seal it appropriately to avoid any seepage or contamination. So biological evidence is what is the main thing here because it can easily be contaminated or even decay. So in terms of practical investigative problems, we have four. So the first one is our clue material needs to be relevant, needs to be authentic or genuine, and also its integrity must be beyond any reasonable doubt, and also chain of custody must be fully maintained. So when you talk about a clue being relevant, the clue is also the evidence. So first of all, it needs to belong to the case, then also give us some information about the crime, and also maybe some witnesses who can be able to authenticate it. Then we have authentic. Authentic is the same thing as original. So you must show that it is the same clue that was collected by the investigator. Then also the same clue went to the lab, and also the same clue went to the court. So you must show that nothing was changed in this stage. Then also integrity. So when you talk about evidence having integrity, it means that it was neither replaced or contaminated or destroyed or even changed due to nature or otherwise. Then you have the chain of custody. So this is a possession log that shows how the evidence moved from the crime scene to the court. So you must indicate the date and time and the person who handled that evidence. So you can now go to crime scene management. So these are the things that at the end of the day should be able to do, be able to prepare a crime scene, the team composition, and the stages involved, and also safety considerations. So when it comes to crime scene protocol, the first one is interview. So now this is the main investigator, the senior investigator. So he must be able to interview the first responder. So the first responder must be able to report everything that occurred to the senior investigator, then also to examine. So this examination involves examining all items of evidence, and also maybe to find the entry and exit points, and also maybe have a layout of the crime scene, then also to photograph. So photograph the crime scene and also the items of evidence. Then also to sketch. A sketch is a rough representation of the crime scene. So when you are sketching, you can show the position of the victim or the evidence and so on. And also to show the size and relationship distance which you cannot do in a normal photograph. Then also process. So to process the evidence that you'll collect from the crime scene. So now the first person in our team is the team leader, who is also the senior investigator. So he must be able to, first of all, select his members or his personnel and also coordinate with other jurisdictions like other departments then also he must assume control. So he must make sure that his personnel and the security and the crime scene are secure. 
then make sure that everybody has the appropriate personal protective equipment in case the crime scene is hazardous. Then also perform an initial walkthrough through the crime scene. Determine the search patterns depending on the crime scene he's dealing with. And also to come up with a command post, as we saw in the previous illustration. Coordinate with other uh, law enforcement agencies. And also limit access. So make sure that everybody who's coming into the crime scene has been recorded in a log to show that what time they came in, what time they left. Then also release the crime scene once they are done with sorting it. Then the second person you have is the photographer and the photographic log recorder. So first of all is to photograph the scene before they enter. Then also photograph the victims, the crowd, and the vehicles. So in case maybe the suspect was in the crowd, they're able to capture him in the photographs. Then also use photograph the scene through overall. So overall is a from a far, far area, medium, and close up. So for the close up is where you use the measurement scale. Then also photograph all evidence before it is moved. So this is where they'll coordinate with the sketch preparer. Then also the evidence recorder and the evidence recovery personnel. So these are the people who the photographer will collaborate or coordinate with. Then also fingerprints to make sure that they are all captured. So when you talk about latent fingerprints, these are fingerprints that are not visible to the naked eye. So you have to do like chemical enhancements so that they can be seen. Then they can lift, then also come up with a photographic log. So you have, what, you have a photographic log that shows the date, the location, the incident or case number, and the supervisor with the scene investigator. So you capture all this in that table. Then you have the sketch preparer. So you must be able to sketch this crime scene and also to orient the diagram you put like the north direction of a compass. Then every evidence he has, he must put it on the sketch and also collaborate with the team leader on where evidence can be searched for. Then also he needs to take the appropriate measurements. And finally, make sure that he has put a scale. Or if he's not going to use a scale, he must put a disclaimer, not drawn to scale. Then you also have the evidence custodian or recorder. So the first thing he needs to ensure is that all evidence has been photographed before collection. Then also describe the evidence. So the, the envelope where he will pack the evidence, he must describe it and also where it is located on the crime scene. Then also ensure that the sign and date is there and also maintain the chain of custody. Then also ensure that evidence is appropriately collected and packaged. And also ensure that an evidence log has been maintained and also pro personal protective equipment. Things like gloves. You do not want to contaminate the evidence you have with your fingerprints. So you must use gloves or even a mask if you're dealing with things like blood that is infected. Then you have the evidence recovery log. So it shows that the evidence was found, who was their witnesses, and so on. So you have the evidence recovery log. So here we have the description. You describe what is the evidence you are dealing with. Who collected it? When? Where? and also the photographs. So this can be used in the court of law to show that the chain of evidence was not broken. So you have the chain of custody. 
So as we had previously seen, it shows who came into contact with this evidence, what time, where, and so on. So you must capture all that because this is information that is required by the court of law to show that evidence is accounted from the crime scene to the court of law. So we have uh, an example of it here. We have the investigator, the crime scene, the laboratory, the courier, maybe even the evidence custodian. All those, they need to be captured in this chain of custody. Then the fifth people we have are the specialists. So these are external people. So they have knowledge in some aspects of forensic science that probably no one in your team has. So they'll come in with their knowledge. So when you're considering your specialists, first of all, you must make sure that they're competent people and also they are reliable. Then also that they're able to work with the other people in the crime scene. And also they'll be expert witnesses in your court. So we have the anthropologist. He's an expert in bones. The blood pattern analyst who deals with blood spatter. Bomb technician if you're dealing with a bombing scene. The criminalist, the forensic engineer. If you're dealing with a collapsed building. Entomologist is an expert in insects. So they can be able to tell us the time of death. The medical examiner will tell us the cause of death. The odontologist is a forensic dentist. They also have the surveyor. So all these are experts who can be utilized in an investigation. So when it comes to searching a crime scene, you can do prolonged to make sure that you account for every evidence over there. Then also come up with a command post, especially if you're dealing with a major case or a major crime. So when it comes to crime scene investigation, first of all, you want to recognize the evidence to collect it, to interpret it, and also to reconstruct all the evidence at the crime scene. So of course, it's important to be able to meet all legal and scientific standards. So this is a very important step to cater for all these four elements. So you have the stages of crime scene management. So the first one is need to approach the scene. So as you approach the scene, you must be very alert. So all items of evidence or all forms of evidence need to be alert. Then also make notes on any observations that you'll see as you're taking your, as you approach the crime scene. Then also as a team leader, you need to be in the frame of mind to take control of the crime scene. Then also cater for your own personal safety cannot be careless. So make sure that if you need to wear, to, to wear PPE, make sure that it is there. And also consider all resources you will need in order to sort out your crime scene. Then also, after that, you need to secure and protect your crime scene. So once you come into the crime scene as a team leader, take control. And also you see how far, how far does this crime scene stretch? So as you were seeking also, you see how far does this crime scene go? Also make sure that the crime scene has additional security. And also you come up with one person to be in charge. Then also, now this person in charge, it is him who will be making the final decisions. And also you need to take notes. Don't think your memory is so good. So you just write down or even record with the tape. Then also any entries or exits to the crime scene, make sure you record them in a log. And make sure all unauthorized personnel are out. So people like the media, family members, the general public, make sure that they're not inside 
the crime scene. So an example of securing the crime scene is here, you see? Inside here is the crime scene. So, so you just put this barrier tape to make sure anybody who is not authorized, they do not come into the crime scene. Then after that, initiate a preliminary survey. So this is where you have a cautious walkthrough of the scene. So you're trying to see how far does your crime scene extend to. Then also decide how will you search your crime scene. How will you process it? Then also determine the resources. How many people do you need to sort out your crime scene? And what equipment do you need? Then also after you decide your personnel, you'll assign them different roles. So when it comes to the crime scene, you can either use the spiral, start from the end, then you go inside in a spiral formation. We have the strip or line. So you go in a straight line from one end of the crime scene to the other end. Then you also have the grid. So the grid, you will go in a wave-like formation. Then you have the quadrant or zonal. So this is why you will divide your crime scene into four quadrants. Then for each quadrant, you also divide it into four. Then you deal with every quadrant one by one until you are done with all 16. Then you also have the pi or wheel. So this one, you have a circular crime scene and you divide it into six portions. So it is the team leader who will decide which of those crime scene search methods will we use? So depending on the type of crime scene and also the size, how big is it? And also depending on the personnel, how many people do you have? So all those are things that you have to take into consideration. Then you also do the preliminary survey. So your focus should be on the transient physical evidence. So when something is transient, it means that it is not permanent. So any small thing can erase it. For example, if you are dealing with like fibers or even blood, in case it rains, that blood will disappear. So first of all, take care of this transient evidence. Then you come up with a theory. So a theory is like an idea. How did this crime unfold? Then also you must make extensive notes. So to be able to document maybe the conditions, the physical or environmental, the assignments or even the movements of the personnel within the crime scene. After that, you evaluate physical evidence. So when you evaluate physical evidence, you're looking at the information. What does this evidence tell me about the crime you're dealing with? So now once you arrive at the crime scene, you start with the evaluation. Then also you deal on the transient evidence as we saw. Whatever is at risk of getting lost. Then also make sure that you have enough and appropriate packaging material. So we have an example of here, bloody footprints. So how do you want to evaluate this evidence? First of all, you're trying to identify who is the source of these bloody footprints. Then also, how many people do we have? From these footprints here, how many people can we conclude were involved? What was their direction in the crime scene? Then also try to reconstruct. So by reconstructing a crime scene, you're trying to tell who was there, what is the crime you're dealing with, when did it happen, and also where. Where is the crime scene and also how? How did the crime occur? Then also, you could also try to get this DNA, maybe from the blood. Try to come up with an identity. Then also, we can look at documentation of physical evidence. So we can tag, tag this evidence. 
So there is no fixed method. So an example of this tagging we have here. So this, these white things, this is where we have items of evidence. So you will tag here, here, here. Everywhere you see white. So you see these tags are inside the barrier tape, meaning that they have been secured. Then now we have crime scene photography. So you make sure that you photograph the evidence as it originally was. So unless people have been injured and they need immediate care. Otherwise, where the evidence was, do not move it until you have photographed from all angles. Then also we have the medium photograph. So you show their position to the, so this is the overall actually, to the entire crime scene. Then we have the close-up photographs. So for the close-up photographs, you must have either a ruler or a scale. And this scale must be indicated in your photograph. Then also after the photographer is done, the sketch artist will come in and sketch the crime scene. Then after that, you'll prepare photography log ad as we had previously seen. So in your crime scene photographs, have an overall view of the crime scene, medium view, and close-up views. So you must capture all those three. So the eye level captures the normal view. Then also deal with the fragile, fragile parts of the crime scene. Then also, how the evidence was bec before it was recovered. Then also use a scale. First take a photograph without the scale, then you put the scale later. Then also you must make sure that entrances and exits are covered. Then you also have a medium distance photograph. So in a medium distance photograph, you have two items of evidence adjacent to each other. So to show how those two items of evidence are related. Then you also have the close-up photographs. So have an example of a close-up photograph here. So you have the, this is a knife, and you have the scale of the ruler here to show how the dimensions of this murder weapon. Then you also have the sketch. So it establishes size and distance and the relationships. So you have what is known as a rough sketch. So rough sketch and the finished sketch. So the finished sketch is more precise. Can even be done with a computer. So you have a rough sketch. As you see, it is just showing the key parts of the crime scene. So see here the direction north and south is indicated. Then you have the finished sketch. You see it is more precise or more complete. Then we also have, you need to record and collect your physical evidence. So you photograph everything before it is collected. Then you record it in the photography log. Then where needed, use a scale. And also mark evidence in the sketch. Then you complete the evidence log to show who collected the evidence, in what location and at what time. Then also, as you're collecting evidence, make sure you have more than at least two people or more. So to avoid things like cross-contamination. In case the same person co is collecting evidence across the crime scene, there could be cross-contamination as a result. 
So as we saw here, cross-contamination occurs, for example, when you are using the same tool to collect two types of evidence. So evidence A and evidence B will mix. So therefore, we'll have contamination. Then also ensure your tools are clean. And also have one person. One person is one will be the custodian. So when you bring in the evidence, it will be staying with it. Then you seal the evidence at the crime scene and make sure that all logs, all logs are filled in accurately and completely. So you can use forceps to pick up small items of evidence. Then also things like small bottles are good for trace evidence. So trace evidence are minute items of evidence they like hair, glass, or fibers. And even also things like manila envelopes. They are also good for collecting trace evidence. Then also packaging of evidence. So you must make sure that each evidence is packaged in its own container to make sure that there is no contamination or mixing of the two. Then also packing. So you can use what is a carefully folded piece of paper. But now we are dealing with biological evidence like blood. You know when you, you put blood in an airtight container, you can say that it will either sweat or maybe moisture will accumulate because of the heat. So this moisture will contribute to the growth of mold or bacteria. And this mold will consequently destroy the blood. Or whichever evidence you had collected from the blood, it will be destroyed as a result. So you just need a normal paper bag. Something that has pores so that there will be circulation of air. So you also have the final survey. You go through the crime scene to make sure that everything has been catered for. Then also you must take exit photographs. Make sure that all evidence you have has been accounted for. And also make sure that you don't forget anything at the crime scene. So nothing has been overlooked. So you only have one chance. So make sure that you don't mess up this final part because you'll never get a second chance to do this final survey. And the last part is why you release the crime scene. So when I talk about releasing the crime scene, for example, a crime scene is a house. That house will never remain a crime scene forever. So once you're done with the investigation, you now release it back to the owner. So by this you can either document, you can, I mean you must document the time and date of release and to also who was this crime scene released to. So make sure that all the specialists you have, you have maximized on them. Then also we have the Safety considerations. Make sure these PPEs, everybody has them, be they masks, gloves, and so on. Then also blood. Always assume blood is infectious. So that's why you need the personal protective equipment. Then also, the crime scene may be contaminated. So have that mindset. And also hands. Don't place them wherever you cannot see them. There could be some hazards there and also do not eat, drink, or smoke. Because if you do any of this, you contaminate the crime scene. So some of these techniques you can implement. You can either do not touch your face with contaminated gloves. The same thing you're hearing from this coronavirus thing. Gloves are a source of contamination. So in case you want to touch your face, Exit the crime scene, wash your hands, then you can wipe it. Then also, you can double glove. 
and change these gloves frequently. Then use shoe covers. Shoe covers, when you wear shoe covers, you do not destroy any evidence at the crime scene. And also, make sure you have, for example, if you're going to search a suspect's car or home, make sure it is a different team from the one who searched the crime scene. But in case you're short of people, make sure that their clothes and shoes are changed. Why do we say this? Because you may take something from the crime scene and dump it at the home of the person. So in that way you have jeopardized the investigation. Then also trash. Make sure you collect it. There could be something important that was thrown by mistake. So make sure every trash you have, it is carefully put. And also do not wear jewelry. Why do you say this? This is a safety hazard. Could wear a necklace, then it's trapped somewhere. What will happen after that? So make sure if you have any jewelry, leave it. Don't come to it with the crime scene. Then also, secure your, ma your face and your eyes. You could be dealing with infectious fluids. So make sure that, because these are points of entry, make sure that you have secured it. So that is the end of our lesson. Thank you for your time. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.